Hi guys, this is Sam back with another video and today we're going to be talking about equip progression in MapleStory Reboot. This is a complete progression guide from level 1 to level 250, done to the best of my ability, including nodes for special classes like Xenon, Demon Avenger, Kana, Dual Blade, and Shield based classes. This video guide is based on the written guide I released to the community shortly after 25 stars release and has been verified by many in the endgame. Therefore, by extension, the best in slot has been verified for GMS reboot and is expected to remain correct for best in slot for a long time. The written guide is linked below, although it does not include some of the holistic and subtle points I will include in this video. Now throughout this video, I will be separating equip progression into four stages, from early game, to mid game, to late game, and finally to end game and best in slot. These stages are not set in stone, and you can certainly jump between adjacent stages, depending on your luck, bossing ability and carries, or just personal preference. These stages are also not necessarily meant to be the absolute best equip setup for each part in your progression, but are meant to be accessible equips that are price and time efficient. Ideally, each stage should get you far enough to be able to boss well and move on to the next stage. For each stage, I will also provide a recommended cubing, starring, and flaming strategy. Although these strategies are not purely based on raw calculations or mathematical averages, they do combine some theoretical costs and my practical knowledge and experience as a player to help you make reasonable steps and progress without much waste. And finally, many of you have asked for a purely best in slot guide to aim for directly. However, I am not just simply going to list out best in slot equips because some of them are completely unfeasible without having gone through some amount of previous progression. For example, the technical best slot is the Dark Boss set at 22 stars, which is borderline impossible. Therefore, for existing players, I recommend that you find the stages that you are likely to fall under and move on from there. I have also tried to include rough equivalencies from previous metas, like the Sweetwater Transposed set, or Tyrants, so that we can all know where to move on from there. If you're a new player and don't know some of the niche game mechanics, I will try to explain enough to be able to guide you along. But if you have any questions about the mechanics in detail, like Transposing for example, I will link other video guides dedicated to those mechanics. And as always, you are welcome to leave comments asking me any questions. With that said, I hope you enjoyed the video and find this helpful. Now, before we get started, because a huge part of the progression scheme depends on flames and bonus stats, here is a quick side note on flames. Flames give bonus stats to an equipment, denoted by green numbers next to a particular line. These are randomly generated when you first receive an equip. Now depending on the equipment, you can receive up to 4 lines of randomly generated bonus stats, with different tiers from 1 to 7. These can vary between many categories, including a single line of stats, like strength or dex or int, two lines of stats, strength and dex, strength and int, strength and luck, etc., weapon or magic attack, all stat percent, and many more. For a more detailed list of the flame stats, I have included a link to the strategy wiki list of tiers and stats available, but you don't need to learn it inside and out for this video. Instead, I will specify what specific amounts of stat to aim for in each stage, so you don't have to calculate tiers for every equip. Now it's very easy to get lost in the numbers here, so here are 6 key points you should keep in mind just for your general knowledge. Number 1. No line will ever repeat twice in a given configuration. For example, you can never receive two lines of luck, but you may be able to receive a line of luck and a line of strength and luck. Number 2. Flames do not carry over with transfer hammer. So when you transfer hammer, 
you will always receive the flame of the higher level equip. They do carry over when transposing onto a Sweetwater equip, which I will cover in the endgame slash best in slot section in two specific instances. Number three. On armors, you typically aim for plus stat, or plus HP if you were a Demon Avenger, plus all stat percent, and then finally plus attack. On weapons, you typically aim for plus attack, which is calculated as a percentage of the base attack on the weapon. Number 4. Boss equipment always gives 4 lines of bonus stats, while normal equipment typically do not give you 4 lines of bonus stats. Because of this, I will typically recommend boss equipment sets over normal equipment sets. Number 5. Most equipment are considered normal KMS equipment and can give up to tier 7 bonus stats. However, certain equipment, most notably Gullux, Sweetwater, and Japanese equipment are non-KMS equipment that can only go up to tier 5. And finally, number 6. There are two primary ways of resetting your bonus sets. Powerful Rebirth Flames and Eternal Rebirth Flames. Both these flames will randomly reset your stats, and unlike cubes, there is no concept of tearing up or down when using a flame. Every single reset is completely and totally random. Now, for the majority of your progression, you will stick to using the powerful Rebirth Flame, which can be bought for 9.5 mil in the Hennessy's Potion Shop, and can sometimes drop from bosses. These flames can give up to Tier 6 for KMS equips, and Tier 4 for non-KMS equips. Once in a blue moon, you can also receive an Eternal Rebirth Flame, typically from events or boss drops. Because they are rare and can give up to tier 7 stats, I recommend only using them on high-end boss weapons to try and get tier 7 attack. If you don't have such a weapon and the flame is about to expire, then just use it on the equip you believe will last you the longest. Now if you guys want, I will make a more in-depth video on flames in the future, but for the purposes of this video, these are the main things you will need to know about flames in Reboot. Now for the very beginning, between level 1 to level 100, you typically do not need many equips to get through. Personally, I just equip whatever I can find on the ground and star force the appropriate weapon to 5 stars all the way to level 100. If you would like a helping hand, the TOTS know-how guide on the left side of your screen can give you free equipment sets all the way to level 60. Combine that with the transfer hammer system and you can save a lot of money here. At level 100, once you've made your fourth job advancement, you can also buy your secondary weapon from the secondary seller NPC in Leafree, or get it as part of your job advancement, depending on your class. You can also get your level 100 emblem from an NPC or a quest line, depending on your class. Explorers will have to do one of the longest quest lines to get their emblems here, but it is very worthwhile. Now, I do want to note there are better versions of secondaries available through other means, but none of them are really worth your time or energy at this point. After you get these two equips, you can run Zakum to find the Condensed Power Crystal and Aquatic Eye Accessory. You can also find your Zakum Poisonic weapon here, which you can feel free to star force to 11 stars. At level 120, Normal Hilla is unlocked for you at Oswan. This is your first major point in progression, as you will want to start wearing Necromancer equipment from Hilla. Once you find your flamed Necromancer weapon, you can transfer hammer your Poisonic weapon to a Necromancer weapon with even better flames. At level 125, Normal Von Lian is also unlocked for you. You are free to run it for coins and cubes as well. However, if you want to get equips efficiently, I would wait until level 150 to start running Hard Von Lian, who is 5 times as difficult as normal, but can drop wholesale level 130 Royal Von Lian gear with excellent flames, which you are free to hammer to as well. 
Note that Von Leon also drops the Iphia's Pendant, Iphia's Ring, and Iphia's Earring, all of which are great placeholder equips. At level 135, you can also start running Easy Horntail to find your Deicidus Earrings, Silver Blossom Ring, and Horntail Pendant. If you're feeling confident, you can also run Normal Horntail starting at level 150 to 160 to get these accessories with a higher drop rate. For the early game strategy, you don't need to worry too much because most of these equips will get replaced eventually. But if you'd like some general guidelines, here are some things to keep in mind. Since all of these equipment sets mentioned are considered boss equips, they can all receive very high flames, as mentioned earlier. To save money, I recommend constantly running the four bosses to find equips that have relatively good flames in stat, all stat percent, or attack slash magic attack. The recommended flames to find on these two equipment sets range from 21 stat to 42 plus stat on armor slash accessories, and 17% to 32% of the base attack on weapons. So for example, if the base attack on the weapon is 100, you might want to aim for anywhere from 17 to 32 attack from the flame. The recommended cubing strategy here is just to use the free occult and master craftsman cubes you find while playing the game to roll for epic 6-9% stat on armor and 6-9% attack slash magic attack on weapons. You can typically find these cubes from surprise missions, elite mobs or elite bosses, and events. Do note that Master Craftsman Cubes are sold in the Henesis Pot Shop, but I strongly advise against buying these cubes as they are very expensive for a very low tier up rate. If you must buy cubes, then buy the red or black cubes in the cash shop for 12 mil and 22 mil respectively. Any potential or epic potential scrolls you find can help you very much here. If you have the option of tiering past epic to unique or legendary, I would suggest doing so on the secondary and emblem. If those are already unique or higher, then you can also cube the Deicidus Earring and Silver Blossom Ring, as they can both be good meso and drop gear candidates in the future. But in general, I do not suggest cubing past epic just yet. Now finally, the recommended starring strategy is just to get all these equips to 10 or 12 stars. Note that you can always transfer hammer equips at 11 stars to remove the risk of going below 10 stars. The mid game typically starts for most people once they have finished acquiring their basic equips from early game, and it is one of the longest parts of your progression. That is largely because all of the mid game requires doing pre-quests for bosses in order to acquire the gear. As a result, I would suggest doing these 6 prequests between level 160 to 200 as all of these will be very useful for you in this part of your progression. We have Gullux, Commercy, Root Abyss, which you need to do 10 times to unlock Chaos Root Abyss, Temple of Time slash Pink Bean for 5th job, Magnus, and Mushroom Shrine. Now if you are a class that needs a shield, like an Explorer Mage or a Shadower, that you will also need to do Empress Cygnus. All of these prequests are extremely important, so please make sure you take the time to do these prequests as long as they may be. If you are ever stuck on a prequest, there are several guides on YouTube and Reddit that can help you. In addition, I strongly recommend joining a guild at this point, as many guilds can help you not only do these prequests, but also run the bosses to get these equips. So, Assuming you have these prequests done, here is what you should do and aim for with each of these bosses. Starting with Gollux, you are now able to obtain Gollux Pendants and Gollux Belts. Depending on what difficulty of Gollux you beat, you can obtain Cracked, Solid, Reinforced, or Superior Equips. Typically, unless you are particularly skilled or are being carried, you should aim for your solid or reinforced Gollux equips from normal or hard Gollux for now. 
This requires leaving one or two parts of his body alive before going into the head, respectively. Once you beat Gollux and collect enough coins, you should buy your superior, reinforced, and solid Gollux rings. These are best in slot and can only be obtained once, so make sure you take care to never star them past 12 stars without safeguarding. This is extremely important, so please take extra specific care to not drop, sell, or destroy them in any way. You may have heard that you need to alternate star and boom one of these rings in the endgame, but that is irrelevant for you right now. I will go over that in detail in the endgame section of this video. For now, just take care of these things. If you lose your superior ring, you will have to contact Nexon support or restart your character. It is a fatal mistake that will impact you all the way into the endgame. Now also in the Gollux shop, you can obtain the Gollux earrings. For now, buy whatever earring corresponds with the pendant slash belt you have to get the set effect. For example, if you have the solid pendant and belt, get the solid earring for now. If you'd like to save money, it's not a bad idea to just wear the superior earring from the get-go and forego the set effect for now. Along with Gullux, you also have access to Commercy. From here, obtain the Sweetwater Tattoo and Sweetwater Monocle to replace your Zakim accessories. Keep in mind, both Sweetwater and Gullux accessories are non-KMS equips, so they will always receive weaker flames, even if they came from bosses. However, despite that drawback, they are nearly always best in slot in most cases compared to their KMS counterparts, so make sure to do these quests early. Rutabis has a very short prequest, which you can do in a couple of minutes. However, you should make sure to do all four Rutabis bosses 10 times to unlock Chaos Rutabis. Once you unlock Chaos Rutabis at level 180, you can obtain your Chaos Rutabis hat, top, bottom, and weapon. All four of these equips are highly sought after, so you may want to ask your guild to carry you, or if you are strong enough, to join a party and get them yourself. Now from normal pink bean, typically a level 180 plus, you can get your pink holy cup pocket item. To equip the pocket item, you need to obtain level 30 charm, which you can do by drinking a traits boost potion from events, or equipping Azakam Helmets and Horntail Pendants. After you obtain level 30 charm, you can accept the quest from Big Headward in Hennessy's Barber Shop to unlock your pocket slot. In order to finish the quest, you have to find a Rose Clipping, which you can find by digging up herbs or mining ores in Ardent Mill. With recent patches, this has become a very common item, so it shouldn't take you very long to find it and complete the quest. After completing the long prequest, you can clear Normal Magnus for the Nova Cape and Nova Boots. If you are part of a guild willing to carry you, you can also clear Hard Magnus at level 175 for the Tyrant Cape. He also drops 9 Tyrant Coins per run, which you can spend 70 of to get the Tyrant Boot in the Shadow Merchant Shop in Helysium Downtown Black Market. The capes and boots are all amazing placeholder equips with great flames, but I do not recommend starring them at all, as they are significantly more expensive to star than any other equipment. The Tyrant set used to be the infamous Mesosync meta, so please take care to not star these equips at all. Now, you can also obtain the Royal Black Metal Shoulder from Magnus, which is a nice item to have as part of your boss set. If you manage to stock up enough coins from Normal or Hard Magnus, you can also purchase the Antique Root Gloves from the Shadow Merchant as well. These gloves are good to have, and can serve as a great placeholder. If you are looking for a different option, I also recommend getting the Wings of Fate Cape from Mushroom Shrine as well. While Nova and Tyrant Capes are great options, there is a special trick about these wings. Once you finish the prequest and beat the Tengu boss, which takes roughly an hour, you can continuously talk to the Tengu NPC to keep getting replacement wings. In essence, 
since you get a free flame every time you receive an equip. You can keep dropping the wings and re-accepting them until you get a flame you are satisfied with. The only downside to this is that the wings are non-KMS items, so that they don't have a very high flame stat. However, since this is essentially an unlimited free flaming process, you can really get some great flames for no cost. At 12 stars and level 150, this cape essentially matches a tyrant cape, so it's a very solid option if you have the time. As the final prequest on the list, the only reason I included Cygnus is because she can drop recipes for Deimos shields. If you do not need or want a shield, you can feel free to ignore her. She does give you a very nice level 140 set if you really want a boost, but it's not very accessible as you can only clear easy or normal mode once a week. If you are a warrior that would like to have a shield, or a mage or shadower that needs a shield, then I recommend clearing her to find the Deimos shield recipe for your class. Once you get it, then feel free to get your smithing to level 10 and craft the shield. The Deimos shields are best in slot secondaries for the classes that need or use shields, replacing Fearless and other previous shields with the 25 star update. Finally, we can move on to the meso spending strategy. In some ways, the mid game is one of the most flexible stages in your progression, and you will spend a long time and money in this stage. As you are still collecting equips at this point, don't worry too much about perfecting any one equip. Instead, focus on the overall average of your equips. To reflect this in concrete terms, here is what you should aim for. For flames and KMS equips, you should aim for 32 to 48 stat. If you can get some all stat percent with a stat line, then you can even settle at 24 stat with 1 to 3% stat, for example. For the weapon, you can aim for tier 5 or 6 attack, namely 24 to 32% of the weapon's base attack. As an example, the Fafnir Risk Holder, the Thief Claw, has 86 base attack. 32% of this is roughly 26 attack, so that's the flame a Night Lord or Night Walker would aim for. This will be replaced with Absolab soon, so don't worry too much about getting multiple good lines. For flames on non-KMS equips, namely Gullux and Sweetwater, aim for 14 to 32 stat. Keep in mind that non-KMS equips are much harder to flame for good stats, so don't be discouraged. For cubing, you can feel free to cube many of these equips to unique and higher with red and black cubes. As a general rule of thumb, use black cubes for tearing up and red cubes for rolling for stats. You should be able to aim for a comfortable 12-15% to stat for armor and 9-15% to attack for weapons, secondaries, and emblem. Ignore enemy defense, or IED, and boss percent lines are also good here. The only equips I would shy away from cubing or flaming too much is the solid Gullux set besides the ring. The ring is good for you to cube at any time, as it is a good best in slot candidate. For starring, you should aim for a consistent 12 star across all your newly minted equips for the time being. Remember, you can use Transfer Hammer to get many of your new accessories starred quickly, but you should not use any of your Gullux rings as hammer fodder. If you have completed the previous two stages already, then congratulations, you have made it through some of the most tedious and difficult quests in the game. You have filled most of your equipment slots with decent equipment, some of which you will be wearing for the rest of your gameplay time. This is the section in the game that takes a lot of time, so you may want to consider creating meso and drop gear here as well. I've included a brief side note on the screen about drop gear, so please feel free to pause the video. Drop gear doesn't need to be in any specific setup, so feel free to work with what you have. Just keep in mind that since the best in slot meadow requires 77 monster park clears for each day of the week, I would recommend the greed pendant from monster park as well, as it does give 20% additional drop rate for all equips. With that said, before we dive into the serious meta and the long term goals, 
Let us get through the last two equip slots we have not talked about thus far. Badges and Hearts. I didn't talk about these two slots because neither of them can be flamed, so they are not as much of a roadblock to late game as they were in the past. In addition, the best in slot equips for these two slots depend on the return of certain events, making them not as much of a priority as the other items in the mid game. Now that you are in the late game though, please take extra care to fulfill these slots as soon as possible when you see their respective events return. First, for the heart slot, there is not really any substitute for best in slot. The only long term solution is the level 120 glimmering one droid heart, which is only obtainable through the one droid event. So far, in the three years that GMS Reboot has existed, the event has only come by twice. At the making of this video, there has not been another high level option worth pursuing for this slot, so if you do not have the opportunity to obtain a one droid heart, I would just leave the slot blank and move on. Yes, there are a few accessible temporary solutions, but none of them are worth pursuing due to their rarity or simply insignificance. For example, you can craft a temporary gold heart from smithing, but the amount of stat gain that level 30 heart will give you is simply insignificant for its time. Also, you can get a hard lotus drop that has a 30 day heart that gives you some boss percent, but that item is so incredibly rare, it's not even worth talking about right now. Thankfully, unlike the heart slot, there is some good news for the badge slot. You are able to obtain the permanent level 150 Ghost Ship Exorcist badge from Singapore after completing a relatively simple prequest. This badge can be both starred and cubed, so I would recommend doing so. However, please be careful with the starring, because this badge can only be obtained once. Now, you may be wondering, why did I not recommend this badge earlier? That is because, by the time you are able to enter the late game stage, you will most likely have seen or will see the return of the Sengoku High event. In fact, at the making of this video, another rehash of this event is due to come in 1-2 to two weeks. This event is extremely important, and I would recommend running through it every day that it is available. Through this event, you can obtain the level 160 Sengoku Hakase badge, which is definitively best in slot due to its higher potential lines. Again, since both of the heart and badge slots are best fulfilled using event-only items, I wouldn't worry too much about them for now. Compared to the other equips you will gain in this section, they are not nearly as consequential. With that being said, let's move on to the main late game progression schema. For accessories, the majority of your gear will continue to come from Galux. As a direct continuation from the mid game, you still have your three primary rings, Superior Galux, Reinforced Galux, and Solid Galux Ring. At this point, you should definitely aim for the Superior Galux set with two Superior Pendants and one Superior Belt. That way, you can take full advantage of the Superior Galux set effect, which is one of the key pillars in the endgame. You can also hold on to your Superior Galux Earring if you'd like. Although it is no longer best in slot without the Dark Boss set, it is still very, very good and will satisfy your goals for a long time. Note that these items are on the rare side, so if you find yourself gated by RNG here, feel free to indulge in a Frankenstein approach with some mix of Reinforce and Superior gear. For your final ring slot, you will aim to obtain the Meister Ring, craftable after becoming a Meister Accessory Craftsman in Ardent Mill. This video guide isn't long enough for me to cover how to become a Meister Craftsman effectively or how to craft the Meister Ring in great detail, but needless to say, I have linked a Reddit guide below that can help you to Meister. For the purposes of this video, please be aware that you must possess at least one Primal Essence to craft the ring. This is a very rare item, and can be obtained at a low chance when mining a high level ore or digging up a high level herb. Personally, in order to farm these effectively, I recommend clearing Arcarium daily, as he has a high rate of dropping this material. 
You will also need 50 superior abrasives from NARC, the Ardent Mill NPC, 35 Philosopher's Stones from extracting level 100 plus equips, 800 Twisted Times, 100 Mana Crystals, and 100 Grand Spell Essences, all three of which you can obtain just from hunting monsters. This is a very complicated and involved task, as becoming a Meister in any of the professions is very difficult. If you find yourself unable or unwilling to become a Meister just yet, you may also substitute this ring with any one of the event rings for the time being. However, and I cannot stress this enough, you should aim for this ring as soon as you possibly can, as this is an extremely important item to have for the endgame, given its 25 star cap and high level. With the accessories out of the way, we can talk about the main crux of the late game, the armor and weapon set. If you are coming straight out of the mid game, you will be wearing a combination of four set CRA and clean Nova or Tyrant gear, with a possible antique root glove or similar. Most of these equips will be replaced by the Absolab set, obtainable from Scrapyard and Dark World Tree. In order to unlock these areas fully, you must complete the following blockbuster acts. You must do all six acts of Black Heaven, and at least Act 4 of the Heroes of Maple. These blockbusters can be excruciatingly long, but they are crucial to your progression. Once you complete these blockbusters, you will be able to fight Lotus and Damien and obtain S-Cores and Twisted Stigma Stones respectively. Along with these drops, you can also do the respective daily quests to obtain 4 A-Cores and Faint Stigma Stones per day. Keep in mind that the daily quests are given to you even if you haven't done the blockbusters, so you can do them on your mules and transfer through storage if you would like a head start. Please note that Lotus and Damien are fairly difficult bosses, and most parties will typically require that you be able to solo Chaos Vellum in under 10 minutes in order to contribute reasonable damage. As usual, this requirement can be circumvented through carries. With 20 daily quest items and one boss drop item, you can exchange them in their respective towns for one coin. Using these coins, you will be able to purchase the respective Absolab set items. From the Lotus Shop and Scrapyard, you can purchase the Absolab weapon, gloves, cape, and boots. And from the Damien Shop in Dark World Tree, you can purchase the Absolab weapon, hat, shoulder, and overall. To maximize your efforts, I would recommend acquiring them in the following order. Weapon, followed by glove, followed by shoulder, and followed by both the cape and the boot. It doesn't really matter which order you do the cape or the boot. Note that neither the hat nor the overall is present in this configuration. This is primarily because your primary goal with the Absent Lab set right now is to achieve the 5 set effect, and this is the most optimal way to do that. This means that you can keep your 3 set CRA for late game, particularly your top, bottom, and hat. In fact, as a general rule of thumb, the top and bottom will always be kept for the end game. They are best in slot. In general, overalls are never used because of the CRA top and bottom's double star force and potential lines compared to the overalls. That being said, there is a bit more of a caveat with the hat. If you obtain or have already obtained your Arcane Umber weapon from Lucid, then you will want to forgo the Absolab weapon and obtain the Absolab hat to preserve the 5 set effect. Although this finally forces us to abandon the 50 attack bonus from 3 set CRA, the combination of 5 set Absolab and Arcane well makes up for this difference. With the mainstream armor and accessory sets covered, let's move on to the strategy. For flaming KMS equips, you will want to aim for 60 to 90 plus stat gear, mixing in percent all stat and attack, depending on your RNG. It is also viable to aim for 40 to 48 stat, with a 5 to 6 percent all stat roll here as well. For the weapon in particular, you can finally aim for tier 6 weapon attack, namely 40 percent of the base attack. In the case of an Absolute Claw, aka the Absolute Guards, it would be 41 attack. For your non-KMS equips, you will continue aiming for a solid 32 to 48 stat here, 
keeping in mind that, again, non-KMS equips are difficult to flame. Despite that, you may still have an absolute field day here. All the flammable KMS equips outlined here are considered boss equipment and can be flamed for four lines, resulting in some very high rolls. For cubing, as many of these items will last you well into the endgame, you will want to aim for several stages. Using majority red and black cubes, you will want to tear up all of these equips to legendary and aim for an average of 21%, then 24%, and then finally 27 to 30% plus. For starring, similar to cubing, I would recommend doing it in stages. First, get all your equips to 12 stars, then 15 stars, then 17 stars, and then finally even 20 and 22 stars. For your Absolab equipment, it may be useful to consult several transfer hammer options, which I have listed in the document in the description below. A few notable options would be the antique root gloves, CRA hat, and Japanese equipment, all of which you should at least 16 star before transfer hammering for efficiency's sake. The one thing to note about starring is to make sure to safeguard your equips, particularly the Gullux rings, as they are generally irreplaceable. For these irreplaceable equips, I highly recommend stopping at the recommended safeguard upper limit of 17 stars. As a general rule of thumb, I recommend getting 21% and 17 star safeguard first, and then going on to higher potentials. Really, the sky is the limit here, and you can play the entire game to its fullest just at this stage. As difficult as all this may seem, it's worth remembering that these progressions are meant to take time, and every single step you take is a significant upgrade at this point. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I suspect most players who have reached the meta before 25 stars will fall under this stage. Many of you have asked me about your individual Tyrant and Sweetwater setups left over from the previous meta, and this is my general advice to those players. If your Tyrant Cape and Boot are below 10 stars, I would go forward to the Absolute set mentioned above. If your Tyrants are above 10 stars, for example 12 stars and 10 stars, or you have transposed already, pre or post flames, I would suggest keeping that current configuration and finishing up the accessories in this stage. You are also free to flame well and transpose if you'd like, as that's a huge stat gain with great Tyrant flames. Keep in mind that the flames are kept when you transpose. The same advice goes for the Sweetwater hat, which you can remake from a 22 star flamed CRA hat if you are really trying to avoid both Abso and Arcane. I personally think it's a waste, given that any player who's transposed should have the means to get the Arcane hat eventually, but I digress. With proper cubing and starring, people in this category myself included, will typically have the capacity to clear hard lucid and or hard will, and go into the final end game slash best in slot setup. I do want to make it clear that this is certainly not mandatory. If you are unwilling or unable to farm droplets and participate in the hard boss fights, you are certainly free to follow the general late game equipment setup outlined above. While I personally believe going above 20 stars on your Absolute set is generally too expensive, even with proper transfer hammer options, that is just my personal opinion. You are free to decide what route you wish to pursue, as they are equally viable in the current meta. And finally, we reach the most complex and time-consuming stage of all, yet arguably the simplest stage of all to explain. Many of these upgrades are very precise, and you may not necessarily want to go all the way through for some of them. Regardless of what your stance is, I recommend watching through this to know what further upgrades you have for both your accessories and your armor. Starting with the accessories, you will notice that they generally remain the same as in the late game stage. However, unlike the late game stage, we will perform many major tweaks with the transposing and transfer hammering system in order to maximize our stat and attack gain. First, you will have to 22 star two Meister rings, one of which you will wear for yourself, 
and the other you will transfer hammer onto your superior Galox ring to produce a 21 star superior ring. This is one of the biggest optimizations you can make, as there is no other way to bring your superior ring to 21 stars without risking an extremely high chance of booming this once in a lifetime item. Now, at the making of this video, Galox Shop Restock has not been confirmed. If in the future, Galox Shop Restock is confirmed, then you can simply star a new superior ring as high as you'd like. Second, you will have to create a transposed Sweetwater earring. Now, to do this, you have three separate options. Number one, for the first best slot, you can flame and 16 star the rare Ocean Glow earrings from Tower of Oz. Then, since transposing will carry over your flame, you can transpose and proceed to 22 star your Sweetwater earring. And number two, for the other best in slot, you can also purchase the inverse jewel earrings from Critias for 200 Critias coins, aka the Tyrant Glove coins, and perform the same procedures as with the Ocean Glow earrings. And number three, at the expense of two stat and one attack, you can also craft the Meister earrings in Ardent Mill and perform the same procedures of starring and perfect flaming before transposing. I highly recommend this option because you will already be a Meister in accessory crafting from the late game, and this option is far more accessible. As a side note, the Meister earrings do require 10 confusion fragments. Just like Primal Essences, you can find them at a rare chance from ores and herbs. However, I personally recommend both Madman Ranmaru and Arcarium for a much higher drop rate. Also, a perfect flame is rather hard to define in a cost-effective way, but in the interest of time and meso cost, I would aim for either 85 plus stats, or 75 plus with 3% stats, or 48 stat with 6% stat. Third, you can obtain the rare and coveted Papalatus mark from Chaos Papalatus. Then, applying the same technique as before, we can 16 star and perfect flame the accessory before transposing to a Sweetwater monocle. If you are confused on the transposing rules, just know that unlike transfer hammering, you can transpose an item up to 20 levels below the Sweetwater item. And that brings us to our fourth and final common accessory optimization, the Kana's Treasure Ring. You can obtain this ring as part of the Princess No prequest, for which I will include a link in the description. If you kept or are still able to obtain this ring, you are free to star force this to 17 stars to replace your solid Galax ring. Then, you want to alternate your Kana, solid, and then reinforced ring and star them one star at a time until one finally blows up between 18 and 20 stars. These extreme optimization options are frankly unnecessary, so if you lost your Kana treasure ring before the patch like I did, don't worry too much about it. Also, if GMS ever decides to make the Gullock's shop restockable, you will then simply star every ring to your heart's content anyway. As you can tell, these optimizations can get pretty crazy so make sure to take your time. They are endgame for a reason. Personally, aside from the first two optimizations, I wouldn't pay too much attention to the other two unless you are simply dying to min-max this game to the extreme. Speaking of min-maxing this game to the extreme, let's talk about the Dark Boss set. Up to this point, we've talked about the four major accessory optimizations, and the majority of players won't ever make it past that point. However, just for the sake of completeness and future-proofing, let's take a moment to indulge in the Dark Boss Set fantasy for Reboot. It is very difficult to compare the rare Dark Boss Set accessories in the current GMS meta, as their set effect gives, amongst other stats, 10% boss, 10% IED, and 5% crit damage. It is really hard to compare these effects to the stat and attack given by their GMS counterparts at 22 stars without manually calculating the damage formula for each particular individual. So it's really a hard question of whether or not these are still endgame and reboot. As a result, this section may feel a bit open-ended, because each class reacts with these set effects differently. However, we can apply some heuristics and simplify the problem. 
If we were to simply ignore the effects and just compare the attack and stat differences, we find the following conclusions. The Damien and Lotus accessories will only hope to match their Sweetwater counterparts at 22 stars, assuming the entire four set effect. This is especially true now that we can transpose a flamed Papaletus mark onto the monocle. The 22 star Dreamy Belt only exceeds a 22 star Superior Belt by virtue of its flames. Without them, it is a paltry 18 stat ahead and 7 attack behind. Even if we were to assume the most optimal flames for the Dreamy Belt, it's hard to see it winning with anything less than 22 stars, as it would be behind by double digits of attack in exchange for stat. For example, a perfectly flamed 21 star Dreamy Belt is roughly 70 stat ahead and 20 stat behind a perfectly flamed Gallux Belt. In addition, if you were to wear a Dreamy Belt, you would have to forego your Sweetwater Earring and wear the Superior Earring again to complete the Gallux Forset. Finally, perhaps the one ray of hope for the Dark Boss set, we have the Cursed Spellbook Pocket Items. I can say with 100% certainty that they are best in slot in any configuration, because they can achieve far higher flames than the Pink Holy Cup. Frankly, if you have even any one of these items, I would say it's worth it just to be able to wear it and show it off. Because if you're at that point, you're probably not too pressed for damage anyway, so it doesn't really matter. In KMS, and soon in GMS, we will also have access to the Jin Hill Appendant and Black Mage Badge. For all intents and purposes, these are also not best in slot in GMS Reboot, due to the Galax Pendant and Sengoku Badge. That's all I have to say on the Dark Boss set. In the unlikely event that someone actually manages to obtain and 22 star the entire set in Reboot, I can revisit this issue in more precise detail. Along the same lines of rarity and insane min-maxing, classes that use standard secondaries will also have access to Princess No. I won't say much on this particular party quest rewards, except that it is very, very rare and relatively pointless to do. The secondaries that are rewarded here at a very low chance are technically best in slot, but they are truly tiny increases. Just for the sake of completeness, if you must run this PQ, make sure to have a full party of 6 and swap party leader around each member of the party for every run. Make sure someone in your party has either Dark Flare, Reflective Oz Ring, or some other fast way to kill the Pink Whale. In addition, Venom Burst, Bleed, or certain other DOTs will also be useful here. Note that this PQ is rather difficult, as Princess No herself has quite a bit of HP. This is really not meant for anyone at anything less than endgame. It is purely optional. Along the same lines as the Princess No secondaries, GMS also receives the occasional Maple Leaf High event that gives out the true best in slot emblem, with slightly more attack than the normal emblem. If you have not finished cubing your emblem, this is a good upgrade that comes every year. You may also see certain people have the Maple Fest emblem as well, which was obtainable in the past if you went to the live Maple Story Festival in California and got the gift bag code. As you can probably tell, there are certain minimal gains to be had with regards to the secondary and emblem, but they are really not too worthwhile for the most part. I'm just mentioning them here for the sake of completeness. And now, finally, we can begin talking about the Arcane Umber set. The Arcane setup is pretty much identical to the Absolap setup, in both order and form. To obtain Arcane equipment, you must first obtain the Butterfly Droplets from Lucid and Arachno Droplets from Will. Then, you must also farm River Droplets and Stone Origin Droplets from VJ to Moras or Asphera, respectively. When you combine the droplet combinations, 10 river droplets and 1 butterfly droplet will give you 1 phantasma coin. 10 stone origin droplets and 1 arachno droplet will give you 1 arachno coin. Now, armed with these coins, you can purchase the following. From Lucid's shops in Lashland and Moras, 
you can buy the arcane weapon for 24 coins, the arcane gloves, cape, and boots for 16 coins each. From Will's shop in Asphera, you can also buy the arcane weapon for 24 of his coins, or the hat and the shoulder for 16 coins each. The first item you should get is the weapon, no exceptions. This will allow you to use your Absolab hat and gain a significant attack boost. However, depending on your situation, you may want to farm at Lucid first or farm Will first. If you look at the amount of coins you need to spend for each shop, it seems like you should get it from Will's shop, as you need one less equip from there. However, for most of you, Lucid will be likely the more accessible one, as she has a far lower arcane force requirement. Either way, 17 star and flint once you get it. Be extremely careful with the safeguard. Make sure to check it every time. Farming 240 droplets can take you 2-3 to three months of regular grind sessions, so be very careful. Afterwards, you can do the same thing you did for Absolab to the other equips in this order. For the Lucid side, get the gloves first. Then, for the 3-4-5 set effect, you can either get the cape or boots first. It doesn't really matter. You will have to look at your particular setup and just replace the worst of the two items with its arcane counterpart. For the will side, I recommend getting the hat first simply because of its larger disparity in flames. Shoulders cannot get flames, so the arcane shoulder is not as big of a boost. Now, for people who are already transposed, or who may be heavily invested in the tyrant meta as mentioned earlier, I will go on a case-by-case -case basis. Number one, if you do not have a transposed glove, then go and get arcane immediately. Otherwise, you may want to consider replacing your Sweetwater in one fell swoop. Personally, I have replaced my non-transposed Sweetwater glove with arcane already, and will be working on replacing the boot and cape as time goes on. If I had a 10 star transposed boot with a bad flame, and say 23% luck, I will be replacing that as soon as I can. Regardless, this is a really long and time consuming process. Best of luck with the hard lucid and will equip drops. The flaming strategy here is to go for 100 plus stat for each of the arcane equips. Depending on your situation, you can keep 95 to 100 stat as well and prioritize cubing, but you should be able to decide this on your own at this point. With the arcane open in particular, you can start rainbow flaming it. I personally keep a decent tier 4 to tier 6 attack flame on it regularly because it isn't very expensive to get with red flames. Meanwhile, I just throw rainbow flames on it. That way, I still have a decent working claw each week, but I can still test my luck for tier 7 attack as soon as I get rainbow flames. Now for the level 160 and below equips, you can feel free to aim for 70 plus stat and work your way up. And again, for non-KMS equips, aim for around 35 or more. The earrings, as mentioned before, should be perfect before transposing at 16 stars. That typically means around 85 plus stat, or 70 plus with 3%, etc. Whether that is Meister, Inverse Jewel, or Ocean Glow, it makes no difference. They all give the same flame stats. The cubing strategy here is the same as above. Go for 24, then 27 to 30, then 30 plus. For the glove, you want to aim for two lines of critical damage. And for the weapon, secondary and emblem, that really depends on your particular weapon secondary emblem setup. I will link a calculator below, but you can find many online. As a general rule of thumb, 3-line attack is the perfect lines, with 2-line attack and 1-line boss being very close behind. The starring strategy is also fairly straightforward. The accessories you can work on as before, 17, then 20, then more than that, with special exceptions for the Gullux and Connock rings. For arcane equips, go for 17 with safeguard. Keep in mind that starring the weapon past 17 stars is the same thing as starring any other arcane equip. 
every arcane equip gives the same stats after 15 stars, so it makes no sense to risk your expensive weapon first when you can do the others. Of course, really, at this point, you're better off praying for equip drops from Hard Lucid and Will to go past 17, so just use whatever you can get. Theoretically, Arcane Set only beats out 22 star Abso Lab at around 19 stars, but 22 starring 5 pieces of Abso can be even more time consuming and a larger mesosync. Yes, in a sense, Arcane is actually more accessible and viable than 22 star Abso, due to the large meso and boom cost of 22 starring and equip. With that said, that's the general gist of the endgame slash best in slot setup. Much like this video was, the endgame setup is a long and tedious process, so take as much time as you need. It's easy to get wrapped up in this theory, but make sure to take time and enjoy the game. You do not need to min-max this hard to clear bosses and have fun, so make sure to enjoy it. Also, as of August 31st, 2018, KMST, the Korean test server, has also released the newest best in slot Genesis weapon which is a lucky weapon. This will change the equipment setup to 4 set Arcane Umbra and 3 set CRA for the technical best in slot. However, because you have to kill the Black Mage to even get the weapon, I will not be talking about this weapon in this video, nor should you ever base any part of your progression with the Genesis weapon in mind. It is truly an insanely difficult weapon to obtain, and I doubt even the deepest of endgamers will be able to obtain it in a very long time. If you are one of those endgamers, then I'm sure you have dedicated enough time to not have to watch this video. Now, of course, now that we've gone through the four main stages, we have to go through a couple of special cases. Namely, we have to deal with Demon Avengers, Xenons, Kanas, and Dual Blades, because they either have a different stat system or equip system. Thankfully, they don't stray too far from this main equip progression scheme, and these are really slight details to keep in mind if you play any of these three classes. If you are looking for information on shields, please go back to the mid-game section where I talk about Cygnus. I will try and include a timestamp in the description. Starting with DAs, there are three points to make. First, instead of a transposed Sweetwater Earring, you will use a Meister Earring directly due to the 10% HP set effect with the Meister Ring. Second, for your endgame slash best in slot, you don't necessarily need to transpose a 16 star Papalatus Mark. You can do it if you want to, but the difference is rather inconsequential, even when considering flames. You will only miss out around 600 HP, up to 15 attack, and up to about 30 to 40 strength, which is pretty insignificant for a DA. Lastly, if you do not like the equip schema I laid out in this video, you can also consider using the 22 star Dominator Pendant with a 21 star Superior Earring, because the Pendant gives 10% HP at its base. However, this is not very recommended in general for anyone, so I am only including it for completeness sake and for an additional option if you so choose. For Xenons, things can be confusing, especially because of how much all stat the Sweetwater set gives, especially since we can now flame tyrants and then transpose them over. With that in mind, Xenons are still free to flame tyrants, 12 star them, and transpose over to their Sweetwater counterparts. However, this will include the Tyrant Glove, so I don't really recommend doing this unless you want to. Keep in mind that invasions are now going to be quite slow, because very few people are really running for Tyrant or Inverse anymore. If anything, I would simply say that the Sweetwater Transpose route is good on paper, as it does give very good stats. However, the cost and accessibility of the entire process can be very frustrating, so I personally would still recommend the main Absolab and Arcane route. One thing is for sure though, the Tyrant Belt is not worth it. The superior Gullux belt route is certainly better. All the general equips, Gullux, Meister, Sweetwater, etc., give all stats, so if you flame your equips properly, Xenons will have an absolute field day here in GMS. For Kana's, things get a bit hairy. Kana gets one magic attack for every 700 HP and almost 
every 700 MP that she gains, so there needs to be a few minor adjustments. Namely, for the rings, instead of using the solid Kana and reinforced ring starring method I outlined earlier, most Kanas can be satisfied with the event rings. This includes Master SS, Synergy, and Chaos rings. However, if you get to 18 or 19 stars on any of these rings, then their event ring counterparts would no longer be technically the best. As mentioned before, the difference is quite minor. It really depends on how you cube for HP slash MP percent versus in percent as a Kana, which is a topic far too intense for this video. For now, just keep in mind that the event rings are still better than the 17 star rings. Please note that the Meister and Superior rings are still best in slot due to their higher star setup at 22 and 21 stars respectively. And lastly, for dual blades, there's not really much to say. There's only one specific case that you should keep in mind for the Katara. Get your Sweetwater Katara and do a 16 star transpose from Fafna Katara or Japanese Katara. For normal servers, Japanese Katara is mandatory given the extra scroll slot. However, for reboot, both are fine to transpose at 16 stars. Once you transpose, you will have a 15 star Katara. Then, because the Sweetwater Katara is so rare, you will want to 22 star a second CRA or Japanese Katara and transfer hammer to get a 21 star Sweetwater Katara. That way, you don't have to risk the boom chance and only need to find one Sweetwater Katara to transpose. Alright, that's pretty much all there is to say about reboot equip progression. Keep in mind, this is my best attempt at suggesting an accessible, relatively inexpensive, future-proof, and sane progression route. There are other options available, especially in the mid-game, but I decided to choose the route that is most comfortable to most people. Keep in mind, most of these upgrades aren't terribly risky, as you could very easily play the game having never gone above 17 stars on any of your equips. If you cube and flame well, you can very easily hit 40k stat and do super endgame bosses. With that being said, I hope you found the video to be helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below and on stream. Even over here in the script writing pre-production phase, I am getting the feeling that this video will be very, very long. So I will try to include as many timestamps and clarifications as I can in the descriptions and comments. Between the script writing, editing, and research, this video took hundreds of hours and many weeks of preparation. So please make sure to leave a like to let me know you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you'd like to see more quality content. Best of luck, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Happy mapling!